Where does your focus aim? Is it for the customers or is it on you? It is so important to give value to others. This is the most powerful secret to success. If you want to expand your business, it is crucial to consider others. The powerful way to be successful and profitable is by giving. If you give or provide immense value to others, you will set yourself up to receive value back. Listen to Bob Berg's discussion on the need to be a go-giver to build a business on the Dominate Your Market podcast. See how you can influence others by understanding human nature. Welcome to the Dominate Your Market podcast, where we interview leaders, CEOs, founders, and high-impact business development professionals to get their insights on how you can grow your business efficiently, build an amazing company, and still have a life. Today's guest is Bob Berg, and for for over 30 years, Bob has been successfully showing entrepreneurs, leaders, and sales professionals how to communicate their value and accelerate their business growth. He's also been a Hall of Fame speaker and co-author of the international bestseller, The Go-Giver, which has sold well over 1 million copies and been translated into 30 languages. I'm so honored to have you on the show today, Bob. Oh, the honor is mine. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is this is great. I mean, the whole go, go giver thing. I think a lot of people, even on the platform of LinkedIn, probably should read your book and understand that, that uh, try that approach and not the take 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 approach. So I'm, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to diving in. Thank but you. first off, for listeners that don't know you, which I've known you of you for a long, long time, um, give us a little background on where you kind of came from and how you got to where you are now. Uh, Just very briefly, I started out as a broadcaster, uh, wasn't particularly good at it and graduated into sales. Um, I floundered there for a few months because I I had no formal sales training, Uh, came across, and this is about 40 years ago now, I came across in a bookstore, a couple of books. One was by Tom Hopkins and the, and one was by Zig Ziglar, two of the uh, iconic you know people in in our sales space. And I really studied their their books is how I started. And I mean, I really, really studied them and and uh, within a few weeks, my sales began to go through the roof. and it was it was encouraging to me because what it said was that if you have a system, and I define a system as simply the process of predictably, achieving a goal based on a logical and specific set of how-to principles, right? So yeah. if you had a a, a a system, a process, a methodology for doing something, you could pretty much accomplish it, right? And so at that point, I really began to dive into sales big time. And uh, what I loved the most was that sales was really about personal development. And it was a matter of, of uh, of building yourself on the inside first, understanding that success manifested outwardly, but it first had to start from in here. So I began getting all the great classics of sales and personal development. And oh, it was just, I loved it. And, uh, you know, eventually worked my way up to sales manager of another company. And uh, from there, started teaching other companies how to do what, what was working for me. Well, thank you for that. And for anybody listening and not watching on YouTube, I see a bazillion books behind you, which is very impressive. I've got just a few over here to my left, but I do have more in boxes. You have a massive amount of books. So you can tell that you're definitely a a very knowledge seeker. You're you're definitely, and so am I, by the way. And and a lot of the books you've mentioned, I've read. So because I think we're both probably similar age. So I think we've. Oh, I think I'm older than I think I'm a lot. At least you look you look better for your age than I than I do for mine. I'll, I'll be 65 later this month. I think you're a lot younger than that. I turned 60 in six months. Oh well, good for you. You have good genes. <laughs> Thank you very much. But anyway, <laughs> let's get on to this go giver stuff. What prompted you to focus on this go giver approach and then to actually write a book about it? Well, many years ago, and this is back in the mid 90s. Uh, my first book was Endless Referrals, and the subtitle was Network Your Everyday Contacts into Sales. So it was really a book on business networking or relationship building. Um, and this is back in the days before there were tons and tons and tons of books on networking. Now there's you know lots, of, and they're all great. I, I've read many of them, and I learned from all of them. Um, but back then, I think there was myself and maybe two other people who had wrote on networking. So uh, yeah, it was a, a bit more of an open space. But um it was really a, a how-to book 
for entrepreneurs and salespeople who knew they had a great product or service, they they knew it brought wonderful value to their customers, but they they perhaps didn't feel comfortable or confident going out into their local communities and building the kinds of relationships where people would want to do business with them directly and or refer business to them. So it was a step-by-step guide. It was a system for 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 creating endless referrals. And the the um the basic premise was that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust, which has sort of been what I've been known for, I guess, for the 30 years or so I've been doing this. And yeah. so, and that also makes its way into the go-giver. But, um, but it was a how-to book. And I'd always loved reading business parables because parables, which are stories, tend to connect on a a deeper heart to heart level. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could take the basic idea of the all things being equal uh, or the no like and trust and turn that into a parable. So I got together with John David Mann, who's a fantastic, just amazing writer. And uh, I told him, you know, the story idea, uh, you know, and he and I discussed it and, you know, he, he thought, yeah, I think we have some potential here. And and John was really the lead writer and storyteller of The Go-Giver. I mean, he's just, he's brilliant. I'm a, I'm a how-to guy, right? I'm step one, step two, step three. So um, so really, that was it. It took really only a few months to, to write the story. Um, but uh, we got turned down, I think, by 24 publishers along the way until oh. we found our 25th one. And, wow. uh, and it, it worked out pretty well. That, that, that's incredible because, I mean, you know, The Go-Giver to me, and I've got lots of questions for you for people that would would kind of go against that and say, wait a minute, I've given and given and given and I've not gotten anything and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, um, you make an interesting point where you say the go-giver philosophy is totally congruent with human nature. Well, that can go many ways, right? Mm-hmm. How, how can you explain that? Well, first, you know, when let's look at what do we mean by the term go-giver, Okay. So it's it's simply that person who understands that shifting your focus, which is really the, the key, mm-hmm. shifting your focus from getting to giving. Now, when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others, understanding that doing so is not only a more fulfilling way of conducting business, it's, it's the most financially profitable way as well. But why? Well, it's not for any woo-woo way out there, magical, mystical reasons, not at all. It, it's very rational. Again, as as you uh, brought up, it it, <clears throat> it aligns with human nature. One thing, you know, um, Mike, that I often will, will lead when I speak at a sales conference, one thing I'll often lead with is uh, I'll just say to everybody, nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet. Ooh. OK, and we actually we all laugh because, you know, of course, you know, why would they? They don't right? They don't care that I have a quota to me. Right. They're not going to buy. Right. They're, awesome. they're not going to buy. Right. They're not going to buy from from you or from me because we need the money and they're not going to buy from us because we're nice people. Uh, they're going to buy from us because uh, they believe that ultimately they'll be better off by doing so than by not doing so. Uh, and actually, I think this aligns with the. Uh, Dale Carnegie's, uh, what I think was his underlying premise of how to win friends and influence people, which again, totally congruent with human nature. It's, and it's where he said, um, ultimately, people do things for their reasons, not our reasons. Okay, now, so here's the, the congruency with human nature. When you're that salesperson or entrepreneur who truly, truly wants to bring immense value to that person, right? When you're looking to discover what they need, what they want, what they desire, when you truly want to help them solve their challenges, when you want to help bring them closer to happiness, well, they feel good about you. They feel great about you. They want to get to know you. They like you and they trust you. They know you have their well-being at heart, right? And you're much more likely to attain the business. That's what being a go-giver is. So again, there's nothing, you know, self-sacrificial about it. There's you're not giving away the store. In fact, go-givers tend to sell at the much higher end of the price scale because we focus on selling on high value, yep, not low price. So why do you think, um, with all the information that's out there and all the sales books that talk about bring value, bring value, bring? There's lots of resources out there now, right? Since your book came out, 
Oh, why, right. There's so many wonderful books out there. Sure. Well, why do you feel salespeople are still not doing it? And I would bet, I would bet that the majority, greater than 50%, mm -hmm. greater than 50% of salespeople are still not doing it. Why do Mike, you think that is? Uh, yeah, first, you bring up a great point. And I, and I think, again, we're talking human nature, only this time on the salesperson side. As human beings, we are self-interested creatures. Oof. Okay. Now, what uh, we don't need to deny that because, again, successfully, and you know this, you teach us successful people deal in truths. Okay. Uh, they understand the truth. They embrace the truth. They don't let the truth stop them, but they utilize those success, pr those principles, those truths in order to advance themselves and others around them. Okay. So, so what happens is, most salespeople, they're self-interested. And plus, by the way, they really believe in their product or service Sure, and think everybody should have it because it would help everybody else. Now, take those two ideas, right? <laughs> self-interest, right? And I love my product and think everyone should, well, that's a recipe for being eye-focused instead of other-focused. So it's not that we need to deny our self-interest. Again, if we do that, we're denying human nature, we're denying truths. No, but it is important that we temporarily suspend our self-interest. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Right. And that's the key. When we do that, now we can go in there and we can focus on the other person. That's really, you know, I, I think that's so true though. I think that human nature is we, we are more interested in ourselves than other people. Right. And so I think even just in conversation, I'm, I'm sure you've been in conversations where the other person just talked about themselves, even in a social setting the whole time. Me, 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 me. Hey, Bob, see you later. Good seeing you again. Take care. And you're like, whoo, okay, I'm tired, right? Well, you know, it, it's interesting you say that because one of the best ways when you're meeting someone for the first time, one of the best ways to to really bring value to them is to let them talk about themselves, which as you said, they probably want to. And I often ask my audiences, have you ever been in a conversation with someone who let you do practically all the talking? Well, if so, didn't you come away from that conversation saying to yourself, wow, what a fascinating conversation was yeah. that person is. <laughs> and, you know, when I first got into sales, it wasn't when I first did, but a, I think a second uh, job in sales, did a lot of phone work, okay? But it wasn't just to prospect, it was to also to, to create the relationships and make the sale, mm -hmm. and it was through the phone. So one thing I realized that I picked up on very quickly, Mike, is that nobody, but nobody ever hung up the phone on me while they were talking. While they were oh, <laughs> right. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> if I'm talking, if I'm making it about me and it's right, well, they're not really that interested. If they're talking about themselves, they are engaged. And once they're engaged, now they're much more open. No one ever hung up on you when they were talking. When they were oh, talking, oh right? God. I was talking. Oh, they hung up. I learned that quickly. <laughs> but how? I've never heard that. I've never heard that term before. Nobody's ever hung up, hung, hung up on a sales call when they're talking. Right. Wow. While they're talking, people don't hang up while they're talking. <laughs> that is that. That statement right there is profound. It really is because I think any salesperson would be like, "Duh." Well, then go out and do it, Joe. Go out and sell like that, right? You know, that's just mm. such a no-brainer. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, one yeah. of the principles in the book um, you talk about is influence. How does a go giver create influence both personally and in business? And how does that directly relate to the new business and even to leadership? Well, you know, again, we we go back to definitions because it's always so important to you know to be on the same, to be facing the same direction as Pindar, the mentor, said to uh, to yep. Joe in the in the uh, in the go giver. And so, influence on a very very basic level can be defined as the ability to, to move a person or persons to a desired action, usually within the context of a specific goal. Okay, now that's the definition, but that's not really the essence of influence. The essence of influence is pull, pull mm -hmm. as opposed to push. Uh, most of us have heard the saying, how far can you push a rope? And we know the answer is not very far, well, at least not very fast or very e effectively. That's why great influencers, great salespeople, great leaders, that's why they don't, they don't, they don't push. They don't push themselves. They don't push their ideas. They don't push their will on others. Uh, their goal is not to have people comply, but rather to have people commit. 
Okay. Now they do this through through pull, um, and and this is key. Now, uh, you know, this is by the way why you hear people, why you never hear people say, "Wow, that that Tom or uh, you know that Joanne uh, sure has a you know." Um, they're sure influential. They have a lot of push. No, you don't hear that. You say they're influential. They have a lot of pull, right? So that's what influence is. Now, how do you how do you get to that point? Well, we've been sort of uh, talking uh, about that a little bit. It's by moving your focus off of yourself and placing it on them. It's asking yourself. It's asking yourself, how does what I'm asking this other person to do? How does it align with their goals? Mm. How does it align with their needs, their wants, their desires? Uh, how does what I want this other person to do, how does it align with their values? How does it solve a problem for them? How does it help them get closer to where they want to be, right? And when we ask ourselves these questions, Mike, um, thoughtfully, uh, intelligently, uh, authentically, right? Uh, not as a way to manipulate another yeah, human yeah, being yeah, yeah. into doing our will, right? <laughs> but as a way of of building everyone in the process. Now we've come a lot closer to that, to earning that person's commitment, as opposed to trying to depend on some type of compliance, which is, you know, again, force or manipulation or mm -hmm. threats or, you know, those kinds of things. One of my great friends and mentors, her name is uh, Dondi Skumachi. She teaches leadership and influence mm -hmm. for some of the masterminding, some of the biggest companies in the world. And I, I love what she says about this. She says, compliance will never take you where commitment can go. Oof. So it's always a leader's, it's always an influencer's, it's always a salesperson's job to earn commitment as opposed to trying to depend on, on any type of compliance, which is not sustainable. That is so good. You know, what I'm hearing from you, this, the whole go-giver idea and approach, it's almost like a mindset. Would you say it's, oh, a, there's a big part of it is mindset? A, a huge part of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Because if you're going into a, a sales conversation or any, even a social setting and your mindset is centered on yourself and, and that's what you innately go to is just me, 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 and me, mm -hmm. then you're probably not going to be successful in the social environment. You're sure. definitely not going to be successful in the sales environment, right? No way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, it's human nature to be eye focused. And I think, you know, when I write a, a sales letter or when we have a, a product or some type of event we're doing or whatever, and we, Kathy, my awesome business partner, and I will write a, a sales letter. Well, we go through, we write it up, okay? And we go through it, of course, to, to do all the proofreading and all the, the see what, and I got to tell you, you know, and I know this, I teach this stuff, and I find myself going through looking at all the times I write I, or oh, me, yeah. Oh, yeah. or talk about our product or something like that, right? So that first draft or that first edit is all about getting my eyes out there, the personal pronouns out of there and make it about you, the person reading it. So I do the same thing. You know, it's just it's just a matter of staying conscious of it and, you know, and, and right. uh, understanding that. You know, I have a funny story. I had a very, very confident male CEO on the phone. Um, he was an alpha. And we were talking and he was talk, interested in hiring me as, as a CEO coach for him. And I said, well, hey, I'm on your website real quick. So let me ask you a quick question. So um, do you feel like you're serving your customers as good as possible? Like, do you really feel like you're just dialed into their needs and wants and pain points? And he goes, yeah, absolutely. For sure. For sure. So I pulled up his homepage of his website and I said, okay, so, and I shared my screen with him and I said, okay, so when you use the words we, us, or our, that's very me focused, right? And he says, yeah, sure, of course, absolutely. And then, so I say, if you use your, you or your, that's you focused on them. He goes, yeah, I agree with you. I said, okay, let me do a search and find for the word we, right? On the homepage of the website, search and find. When you do that, I'm sure you're aware of this. It highlights the word every time it finds it. Mm -hmm. So his homepage lit up like a Christmas tree. It had 26 version we phrases on the homepage 26 we phrases so mm -hmm. it, it, so when you said the i getting the i out that made me think of that story 
Um, and he just went dead on the, uh, on the call. He just was like, I don't know what to say. And I wow. said, well, that, this is maybe the focus your, your, your company is taking with all your messaging, salespeople and sales calls. You need to make it about them, not about you. Was, was so, he able to accept that? It was interesting. He did not hire me because I think there was a little bit of ego crushing going on there. <laughs> and, and I didn't, I didn't put him down. I just, I just showed a fact. I just showed something visually. So I never did go back to his website to see if he changed it. Yeah. But, it, okay. but I want to tell that story to our listeners based on what you said with where you, you pull out the eyes. You want to get the eyes out of there, right? Yeah. So here's a question for you. And I think everybody listening would want to know this. So if we give, 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 and let's say it's content on a website, maybe it's, it's LinkedIn post. If we keep giving, well, people, they've got all my stuff. They're, gonna, they're not going to want to hire me. That's what people are, are going to be saying, right? So if I keep giving like this, then I got nothing. What do you say to the people that in, have that mindset of the more I give, I'm, I'm, I'm giving away the house here? So I think there are, are actually two questions with that, two, two different points with that. So, so let's talk about them both, if we may. Um, the first one is just in terms of giving away too much information. Uh, it's very difficult to do that. Because for the information to really help someone to the point that they don't need you, uh, it, it, it's nearly impossible to do that. Because it's one thing to have the information. It's another to know how to apply it, to be accountable, to be able to ask the person for that. You know what I'm saying? So it's, yes. it's difficult. So, uh, I mean, I think as long as you give a lot of information, it's great information and it should be very valuable information. I don't think you have to worry about giving too much away because the people who really want to take it to that next level, they're going to be your most anxious, excited clients. Okay. Okay. Got it. Now, I think the other question, though, is what if I'm giving things away to what if I'm just, you know, uh, uh, speaking with people all the time, answering people's questions, doing all those things, and they're not getting the idea that I actually do this for a living, right? And, <laughs> you know, yeah. am I giving myself away too much? And and so we, we do need to know the line in terms of doing that. You know, uh, again, please understand, there's nothing about being a go-giver that uh, is congruent with being a doormat or a martyr or self-sacrificial. Not Not at all. Okay. Yeah. Um, a go being a go giver, simply understanding the uh, idea of the importance of focusing on the other person. But that doesn't mean we we give ourselves away or don't charge or anything like that. Now, so let's say you have someone who you, has asked you a couple questions and you're happy to answer them, and you know it could possibly might lead to to a client, a coaching client, might not. You you don't know, but it could. And so now they're coming back though a lot. And it it's not going to end, you know what I'm saying? And they're not understanding that that you know they and they just may not know. They they may not be trying to take advantage of you. They may sure. not, not know that it's it's now gone past the point where they're being appropriate in in asking you. Okay, and so now is the point where you might just say to them in a very kind, tactful way, because we always need to be able to do it that way and respect the other person. Uh, you know, it it seems as though you've been you found um, our conversations to be of value, and they say, "Oh yeah, this is." wonderful information. And then you say, well, you know, that's wonderful. That is what I do as a professional. And if you would like to have a, uh, you know, client coach, you know, however you want to say professional client relationship, yep. with you, I'd certainly be honored to do that. Uh, would you like to take that next step? Oh, Boom. and so, you know, and then it is either yes or no, it's either yes or no. And now you're in a sales conversation, at least. That was, but again, you do, you need to do it though in a way that doesn't put them down. Sure, make, right? You know, well, I think a lot of people would be very sensitive, right? And if you were it just the wrong way, that could crush somebody, or they could really yeah. be like, "Wow, this was going so well," and yeah. he, what? I feel, I feel, I feel bad about myself now. Right. right. And so that's why I'm saying, you know, I've, I've so, you know, I've so enjoyed our conversation. This is what I do as a, as a profession. I'm, and um, if you would like to have a professional relationship, professional client relationship, I'd be honored to do so. Um, would you like to take that next step? I love or would it. you like to? Yeah. That's awesome. One line in the book that raised a lot of eyebrows and it's where you and John wrote, does it make money? Is that not a bad question? It's a great question. Just mm -hmm. a bad first question. Talk right. about that a little bit. Because well, I, again, everybody's all about, you know, does it make money? 
Well, so this is where, uh, you know, again, Pindar said to Joe, uh, he, he said, he, because uh, Pindar had made a statement. Uh, they were talking about Rachel and her coffee and uh, how good it was. And, and you know, uh, Joe said, oh, if you could sell this on an industrial scale, you could make a killing. And and, and Pindar had said, uh, you know, we could serve a lot of, uh, of coffee or serve a lot of people with the coffee. And so uh, Pindar said, you know, Joe, I just want to, you know, again, make sure we're on the same page. You know, you're saying make a killing. We're talking about serving a lot of people. And Joe said, well, are you saying that making money, asking if something will make money isn't a good question? And Pindar said, no, asking if something will make money is a great question. It's just a bad first question. First, question. first ask, does it serve? If the answer hmm. is yes, now ask, will it make money? Now, by the way, when we say, will it serve or does it serve? We could also say, is there a market for it? Um, but it's got to be for, you've got to first, it's got to be about the other, uh, the person, the marketplace. Again, they're not going to buy because you want to make money. So right. asking if this will make money, again, it's not, it's a great question. Um, but it, it, if it's the first question, you're facing in the wrong direction. First ask, will it serve? Is there a market for it? Is this something that people need, want, desire, what have, what have you, and, and so forth. Now, if the answer is yes, there's a market for it or one that you're willing to create because there may not be one now or there might be that's something you've always got to decide. But let's yeah. assume, you know, a priori, there is a market for this, okay? Now you've got to ask, will it make money? Because if it doesn't, if it's not profitable, well, now you've just got a very expensive hobby. OK, so so but, you know, so first ask if it will serve. If the answer is yes, will it make money? If you first ask, will it make money? You got nowhere to go. You don't even know if it's viable or not. Well, and, and I think even to take that to a conversation, if people are money driven, the other side's going to see it at some that's, point. They're going to smell right. it and see it somehow. Absolutely. Right. And that's and, and they're going to go. Yeah, that's not the right person for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's that's. Um, well, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, especially ones in the startup phase, might disagree with you. But they, when you say it's the only question, when it comes to business, otherwise you're being naive. So when when you is that is that true or no? I think it would be I think it would be naive to think that anybody is going to invest in your project because you want them to. Ooh. That's naive, you know. Uh, real world realistic is do awesome. they feel that this investment is going to be worth their while? That's not naive. That's life. <laughs> right? That's amazing. <laughs> you know, what's interesting is so in a nutshell, we're, we're going to wrap this up, but in a nutshell, so the go giver really is thinking about the other person, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. a mindset number one. So you got to get that right in your mind. And then in the engagement, the conversations or whatever it may be, it's thinking about the other person and serving them, right? That's right on. Yeah. So that's it in a nutshell. Bob, this has been amazing. I was very excited to have you on. Very excited to have you on. Now, if people want to find out about you, give us a website, give us anything you're comfortable giving us contact wise, and that'll be on the show notes. People will be able to hear it on Spotify or iTunes. So how can people get a hold of you? Uh, yeah, the best place to go is Berg, and that's B-U-R-G uh, dot com. And everything's there, including you can subscribe to my uh, daily impact uh, email. It's actually five days a week, not really oh, wow. daily, I guess, but five days a week. Uh, yeah, and everything everything else is there, where to connect with me and so forth. So www.burg dot com. Yes. Awesome. Bob, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, Mike, thanks for having me. Appreciate you. You got it. You've just listened to the Dominate Your Market podcast with CEO, business consultant, and author, Michael Peterson. Growth-minded CEOs hire Michael to explode their revenues, build an amazing company, and create a transformational mindset that encapsulates growth, success, and ultimately, happiness. His book, Dominate Your Market, is creating quite a stir in the marketplace. Go to dominateyourmarketbook.com and get your first chapter free.